So now it's my absolute pleasure and joy to welcome one of my best friends to give us a little bit of input. Roger and I have been friends for 20 years. Um, it's a friendship that spans a generation. Um, and uh, he has been a real solid rock in my life. He's a truly amazing guy. And actually, his thinking has probably, and his writing, which for me has not been engaged with enough anywhere near yet, uh, especially here in this bay, is some of the most influential thinking I've personally encountered. It has helped really transform my view of the world. Um, and uh, I think that where he will take us this afternoon will be provocative and challenging and extraordinary. So embrace it and let's really wrestle with where he's gonna take us because it moves us way beyond our current thinking into the real pragmatics and the practicalities of what a politics of love means every day. So can we give a big welcome to Roger? Uh, the feeling's mutual, the same is true. If you were to ask me, um, one of the, my best friends who's had one of the greatest impacts on my life, I would have to say it was you, Andy. So it's, uh, it's a privilege to be um, living and working in Morecambe Bay. And I, I, I want to say before we go any further um, that this conversation is about Morecambe Bay. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not about Morecambe. But just one or two people who uh, I've been chatting with, um, even today, hadn't quite cottoned on that what we're looking at when we talk about the Bay, and it's represented in this room, of course, is kind of, we're talking about um, Hesham to Lancaster and Morecambe and, and right round to Kendall and Olverston and Barrow and kind of all the stations in between and the hinterland behind. Um, and uh, I don't know why I feel it's so important to say that, but I... I believe it is, because we're not talking about something parochial, although we are talking about something local. Um, when it comes to using PowerPoints, some people don't like lots of print on PowerPoints, and if you don't, that's fine, you can probably stay sitting where you are. But actually, some people do find it helpful when someone is speaking, if the words they're speaking are also appearing. Um, and so you will find, and I will find too, as I begin this presentation, um, just how small or how big some of those words are in this room. Um, I can't understand how there are so many people in the room, given I've already said goodbye to quite a lot of people who were going. Maybe some people came for the afternoon, I'm not sure. But what I was going to say was, if um, in a moment or two, as I get into it, um, you do find you can't see, but you'd like to, I will just stop for a few minutes and we can really kind of cause a bit of a shambles. You can pick up your chair and come much nearer the front. So I'll give you time to do that. I hope that's all right. So this is about um, loving politics. And as Andy already said, um, uh, and I agree with, I, I kind of don't really love politics. So it's not about loving politics as, um, uh, as a, an object of study or as something we participate in per se, it's about a particular kind of politics uh, that we're looking at today. We're talking, as we've already so wonderfully engaged in, about what a politics of love is and what it looks like. Oh, that's interesting. Just have to wake my computer up and hopefully we'll get somewhere. Yes. Um, the only problem is that the, the, our, our friend with his um, camera needs a bit of light as well. So we're balancing the light on the screen <laughs> with what's coming up. So um, before I go any further, I want to do a little bit more about defining love. Now, those of you who've been with us for the whole um, kind of four months of conversations will know that uh, my, my partner, wife, Sue, um, was one of the introductions um, in terms of the talks given on the, on the, uh, the second talk uh, of the first of our um, times together. And she spent some time on definition. And so um, I'm, I'm going to go back there in just a moment. Now, there's some letters. Can anyone read any of those? So it, the light isn't good. It's fine. It, you can in the front. If anyone wants to come closer, 
Please pick up the chair and come closer. You will be able to read them um, from here. Uh, you will be able to read them from here. You can read them pretty clearly from here. So if anyone wants to come in nearer, please do. So, but it's fine because this is only what I'm, I'm giving you and it means you've got a PowerPoint with it on. So don't worry um, if you can't read it, but it's my notes so I read it. That's how it works. So I want to begin with um, an extraordinary um, academic uh, feminist theorist by the name of Bell Hooks, who's an African-American university professor, and she says, love must have a definition. When we say we love, what do we mean by it? And I want to take a moment on that because she's not actually saying um, that we need to define love. She's actually saying love itself calls for a definition, is asking us a question. So like when I say I love you or when someone says I love you, what do you mean? She's asking for more information from the heart of who you or I are. That's the question. What do we mean by it when we say we love? Now, I want to talk to you for a moment about um, two influential writers, or influential to me, uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri. They're neo-Marxists, and between them they've written two particularly important books, a book called Empire and a book called Multitude. And uh, basically what they're looking at is how do we overcome the effects of what they call the empire of capital, the hegemony of the market, how do we overcome that, um, we who are the multitude? And from their perspective, um, although they are neo-Marxists, they would say, well, Karl Marx gave a prophetic analysis that helped us to understand that society is dominated by, um, over and over again, the kind of the upper classes or the established classes or the bourgeoisie or however you uh, describe it, whatever words you use, when it comes to it, the, he may have given us a good analysis, but it hasn't provided us with a solution to the injustice that has continued down the ages. And obviously they were writing, uh, people who call themselves neo-Marxists are usually writing um, in, in, in the after effects of uh, the USSR and the Soviet Union, or recognizing um, that communist China has not actually um, while you might say, well, it's lifted up the poor somewhat, in the end, it's the party cadres and the leaders within the society who just kind of reshape the way that the rich and powerful dominate. And so what they say is that if we're going to find a way of really changing um, this society um, of, uh, of a domination system where the rich and powerful dominate, then we need to recuperate the public and political conception of love. We need to calibrate how we understand love, which is why we need to define it, why we need to get as clear as we can about it. Alan Badu, who's another um, Marxist, he disagrees with them completely. He's written a wonderful book called In Praise of Love, which I really, really like. Nevertheless, in it, he says this, the politics of love is a meaningless expression because you cannot possibly love your enemies. So here is a, a question, and we really need to answer. We need uh, to get the definition clear. We need to uh, be able to answer the question that love is asking us, what does it really mean? So Sue, in the first of our conversations, helped us greatly with definitions, and I want to begin there. So she talked about the four loves. By the way, uh, at the back, can you at least see it says four loves? I just need to get a little bit clear about what I've got here. And so uh, you may remember the four loves. Um, the, these are from the Greek language, which so much of our culture originates with. And in, in, in the Greek language, there are four words for love, which helps us. And so there is the eros kind of love, desire, sexual attraction, without which where would we be? 
Then there is the, the word storges, which is basically family love, the kind of love that uh, you find is kind of, um, is either present or its lack is toxic in our family life. We, we sense these bonds of love, and if there's something wrong with those bonds, then there is hurt and pain. But there is, there's love in the family, and then, as uh, Sue pointed out um, in her presentation, um, r perhaps the, the most transcendent form of love that all of us can uh, find ourselves engaged with, where we find ourselves draw drawn beyond ourselves to another, is friendship. And basically, um, I think it uh, goes without saying, I think it goes without saying, that it is friendship that is so key to the political um, implications of love and we'll look at more of that in a moment so this word filio friendship or mutuality and then there's this other word agape which means love which you choose and I want to spend um, a little bit more emphasis on this particular word of love um, this afternoon because it's this word that particularly carries the political import I suggest because once you add choice to love, the choice to love, rather than simply the response of love or the feeling of love, then it begins to ground love and expand love. If I can explain what I mean, you, you may desire and be sexually attracted to somebody and uh, that may be um, a good passion, it may last a while, it, but when that leads us to make a choice, to basically say to, say to someone, would you be my partner, would, would, would the whole of you, not just your, the, 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 the desire I feel for you sexually, would you be my partner, I choose you, then something is happening which begins to make that relationship and that desire something that is a container uh, from which other people can draw. I'll say more about it in a moment. And similarly, in, in, in a family situation, if, if we can trust one another that we are going to go on loving whatever happens, then there is a potential in that f family life Obviously, families can take many different shapes, but in that family life, there is a huge potential for that family itself also to be a resource of love. And similarly with friendship, I may just get on with you and we might hang out together and we might chill out together, but if, if I make a decision, I'm going to stand by you and hold you in positive regard whatever happens, then there's something in that friendship that now also has a potential to be a carrier of love. Not just between the two of us who become friends, but now we're certain of one another's friendship, we become, a, if you like, a, a pole of friendship. Obviously, there'll be an opportunity to be um, discussing these things. You don't have to take everything I say um, as for, but you wouldn't anyway, but as, as being kind of definitely right. But I want to look about this agape, the choice to love. And the choice to love, I suggest, consolidates each kind of love. All of those three, makes it a resource, and has the potential to include everybody and everything, even including our enemies. Now, I hope you will forgive the fact I'm about to then get quite personal. I hope the personal testimony is okay and you won't misunderstand what I'm saying here. But it so happens that today, this very day, is my wedding anniversary. And Sue and I, uh, Sue told you this, uh, those of you here at the very beginning, um, had our first kiss just a few yards down this prom. <laughs> this bit, I, I hope you won't believe, but we've actually been married for 48 years today. <laughs> and, and have been together for 50. But I suggest it wasn't so much that first kiss, but it was um, a year later, um, 
at a, what has become a very special point on Buttermere for us, up just across the other side of the bay here, that I did ask Sue whether she would be prepared to uh, kind of choose me for life and I would choose her. I want to be careful what I'm saying here because I'm, I'm not about to suggest that there's some sort of ideal thing in ideal marriage. And uh, in any case, anyone who knows Sue and me <laughs> knows what it's kind of like to be uh, Sue married to me and me married to Sue. But, but, but just to be aware, of course, that marriages break, to be aware that families can be toxic, sometimes we, we fail to notice that there still is something absolutely crucial about commitments to one another, lifelong commitments in marriage partnership, um, families that stay together. And I'm not wanting to make some crass point here about kind of family values. Heaven help us, often those points belong to empire, they belong to the extreme right, they belong to uh, me being better than you. And for, I would say that for um, in any case, for th those of us ordinary, fallible mortals, the last thing we need is perfect marriages and perfect families because there's no help to us at all. But I do want to say that when, um, when the, the eros and desire becomes a choice that can last for years, you begin to discover that you are containing a resource that does have political power. It does. Not with a capital P, but it has real power because it actually provides nodes of love and care. It's been great just getting, I, I've not really known Linda at all before we happened to be part of a discussion together and then discovering what she gets up to in her locality because, and, and because it, and it, it's, it's, it, it's not easy actually for a homemaking woman in her situation to be totally reliant on her husband's income to do what she does. But nevertheless, there's something there in that marriage and that family which has clearly got an overflowing resource to the whole of her. It's a village, is it? Yeah. And so that's what I want to very strongly emphasize, that there is something about the choice to love if it's joined to um, eros and desire and if it's joined to family life. Now, my youngest son, um, who is quite an extraordinary character and who spent most of his school career either being excluded or being under threat of exclusion, and is now um, the, the principal of one of the most innovative um, secondary schools in the UK, how that happened, I have very little idea at one level. But he would put it like this, he says, all parents fuck you up. Some parents just fuck you up more than others. And I think we need that realistic understanding of family. But if in the knowledge of that, we can continue to love on one another and believe in one another, something comes out the other end, which um, is completely extraordinary. I mean, I, I said that Andy is kind of, for me, one of the uh, kind of key mentors and leaders, but I would have to say that particular son of mine, like I would follow him pretty much anywhere. And most of what I understand about where society is at right now somehow has come from his creativity and his heart. So what I'm wanting to underline is the, is the grace, the, um, the, the political potential of of ordinary marriages and ordinary families and above all friendships extraordinary potential of friendships and as I'll, I'll, I'll touch on just as we finish in a bit I do want to make it clear that we, we may not all have marriages and we may not all have families but we can all have friends and it, all it requires is for someone to care about the other I was having a conversation with Ray just at the beginning today and he was talking about how it's possible to make friends. You can do it. And I think that it's critical that we do it. And once we have friendships, what friendships can do... Uh, my, my, uh, one of my friends, a guy called Luke Bretherton, he says that they create the mesh from which uh, local politics 
grows and extends. Friendships are a mesh. I think it's important to see it that way. Now, just two quick quotes here. Let's go back one. Theologian Tom Ood, in his book, The Nature of Love, he defines agape love like this. He says, to love is to act intentionally out of sympathetic, empathetic response to God or human beings, I would want to add, and the natural world, to promote overall well-being. Now, that's quite a, in one sense, controversial definition. And I, we would immediately want to say, if we would think all of us in this room, well, don't, don't miss out the passion and, and don't miss out the bonds of family love. Don't, don't miss out friendship. But there's something here that I think is spot on as a way to evaluate what kind of loving we're doing. Because to love whether it's something I'm doing with my partner or whether it's something I'm doing through my family, whether it's something I'm doing with my friends, let alone begin to move out, as we're going to in just a minute, to talk about all those other um, community hubs and factors and connections. If I'm going to do that genuinely, then I need to ask the question, is what I'm doing, in terms of the big picture, is it promoting overall well-being? And I suggest that if it's not, it's probably not really love. I think it was my good friend Mike Love, what a name to have, this is Mike Love, in the middle of the room here, who first uh, recommended me um, the book by philosophy professor Simon Critchley, the book called The Faith of the Faithless. Extraordinary book, I really recommend it. Writing on behalf of atheists and agnostics, he describes agape love as the infinite demand to give what one does not have and receive that over which one has no power. The infinite demand to give that which one does not have and receive that from which, over which one has no power. And then, atheist and agnostic he may be, he says the sort of demand that Christ made in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Remembering that Alan Badiou said that talk about um, the politics of love was a meaningless expression because uh, you can't love your enemies, I'm already suggesting that if you've got someone who you're committed to love for life and them to you, if you've got a, a family who go on loving you whatever happens, if you've got friends, above all, if you've got friends who love you and hold you in constant and unconditional positive regard, then you've got a base from which you begin, can begin to reach out in love, even to those who would threaten your very existence, because you're not alone. I think this kind of love is superlatively political. Adrian Leftwich, who's one of the kind of main textbook writers for political theory, in his basic textbook says we must have definition and he gives us these definitions and coming round the table, most of you were coming up with these definitions or at least making a point related to them. So he highlights the distinction made between those who define politics in terms of the institutions of state government and then those who include a whole range of activities. So one normally is with a capital P, institutions of state government, then those who define politics to mean a whole range of activities and groups wherever decision-making or resource allocation between two or more people occur in human society. So it could be characterized as, as I've just said, politics with a capital P would be what political theologian I've already alluded to, like my friend Luke Bretherton, he refers it to it as statecraft. And politics with a small p 
which he refers to, because theologians and, and philosophers like big words, consociational democracy, or what I prefer to call relational politics. So let's talk about this in terms of, in a shorthand, vertical and horizontal politics, if we may. So these definitions can be seen as the vertical approach, that's the statecraft approach, both are forms and a horizontal approach. So here's your, your vertical approach, that's what I'm using these symbols for, vertical, horizontal. Both are forms of democracy and the electoral dependency of the vertical at first seems more proper and more important. We go out and vote for the vertical in terms of uh, the one person, one vote system. So you've got the representative democracy of statecraft as your vertical, and then horizontally the relational politics between local institutions, charities, organizations, individuals, third sector, and, and all kinds of aspects also of the statutory sector in a locality. I mean, in this room right now, we've got a whole mix of, uh, of third sector people, of people who are part of uh, state institutions like the NHS or the university or whatever else, but somehow or other, uh, we, we, we're able to connect with one another horizontally in a locality uh, much more easily than if we're simply talking about how we make a difference using the vertical. Now, to get a little bit more obvious and a little bit more controversial, the old lie of peace through the rich and powerful. Now, I came back in 2005 to these parts, having started out life here um, as a student at Lancaster University and came back here to do a PhD um, in, in, in basically how... My question was really this. How come whatever happens, the rich and the powerful always end up on top? That was my question. How come? And particularly as someone coming from within the Christian tradition, how come that is absolutely foundational to the Christian tradition as well? And how come it seems like that the Christian tradition even affirms the hierarchical, horizontal, the, hor the hierarchical, vertical, political power? How is that? And uh, you'll be relieved to know I'm not about to um, give you six years of uh, PhD. You can read it in, in, in my book, uh, Church, Gospel and Empire, or you can read it in what I hope is a slightly shorter and more accessible version called The Fall of the Church. But basically, the problem with the vertical approach is it's very resistant to change because it's laid on old imperial assumptions that peace can only come about through the sovereignty of the rich and powerful. So you want good, rich, and powerful, and so you have to vote for some good, rich, and powerful, or if you don't want to vote for the rich and powerful, you vote for someone who's not rich and powerful so they can join the rich and powerful, because in the end, that's how that system works. I'm, I won't get, um, go down that rabbit hole any further right now, but these have subsumed the Western understanding of both heavenly and earthly authorities. So way back, in the, in the early years of the first centuries of the common era, we're talking about first, second, third, and coming into a combination in the fourth century, the, 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 the centuries when Christianity was, uh, was, was beginning and becoming um, a, a, a kind of notable movement, in that period of time, this idea that actually the divine sovereign in heaven and the sovereign leader on planet Earth were kind of both the rich, powerful Caesars, and they legitimated one another. And that understanding of God, I suggest, and that understanding of politics, all the way through the generations of Christendom, right the way down, um, although it's gone through many transformations, to our situation today, is still in our foundational mindsets and expectations of kind of where you live 
and what you drive and what you wear and what are fair uh, differentials in terms of payments and all of those things which immediately when we're talking about uh, you know who is implicated in, in, in we will find all of us to some extent are implicated but it's because that really is what we reckon is okay for society I suggest in our West it's the horizontal uh, sorry, it's the vertical. I'm not helping when I muddle the words. So this vertical statecraft system is actually laid on these assumptions that only the rich and powerful really, in the end, are the ones that can bring peace to the planet, I suggest. And beginning with the partnership of church and empire in the 4th century, this old lie has gone through many transformations. It resulted in the current supremacy of the market and the commodification of everything, including the whole of the natural world and life itself. It undergirds our Western democracies and government departments and is particularly perpetrated through the mainstream media. And we all know this, really. And so that's why we have this problem and don't mishear me, I, I am a great supporter of people who have a career in politics and who are trying to make a difference in, um, in that vertical system. Um, and it's really great that Liz is here today and anyone else uh, who has an eye on national politics and many in this room who are engaged in local politics. So I don't want to be misunderstood. But when we vote, even although we may change leaders from bad to worse or better to best, what we have actually done at the same time is agreed the vain imagination that the rich and powerful must always be in charge. Even communist revolutions only substituted party cadres uh, instead of the rich and powerful. They became the rich and powerful. And I, I, I want to put that out as a challenge. You may find it extremely controversial or you might not. But I think that is our difficulty and is one of the reasons why there, uh, there is at the moment such a, a kind of anti-politics movement and a desire for a kind of populism that is not looking at what is the best for the population but it's a kind of reaction to uh, to a, a vertical politics that's laid on assumptions that unless they can be changed nothing will ever change and i'm suggesting that in horizontal politics cultivating horizontal political space that the horizontal approach to, 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 to decision making, such as the Poverty Truth Commission, where nothing about us without us is for us, is much more amenable to love and can be much more democratic, often with less voting. This kind of politics seems to be emerging everywhere, particularly here in the North, and is the politics that we are engaged in, I suggest, right now. We're, we're engaged in horizontal politics. And the horizontal approach is no automatic guarantee of love, but deliberate relationship building with others, committed to deep listening, generous hospitality, collaborative action, can let in and multiply love exponentially. And if there's any way that we can shift that assumption that the rich and powerful are the only ones who are going to bring about uh, human flourishing and overall well-being, it's as we are at the horizontal level that we can begin to change what the vertical is placed on and based on and what those who vote are doing and what those who, uh, who enter the vertical system are carrying with them and who they connect with um, at ground level. So, a manifesto of love for a relational politics. We're nearly done. Over the centuries since the partnership of the church with the Roman Empire, the sovereignty of the rich and powerful has displaced the deep myths of the Christian story from the political sphere. Don't panic, I'm not about to uh, turn this into some sort of Christian propaganda exercise. I'm rather wanting to clarify what has actually happened. So the deeper myths of the Christian story have been displaced. A key myth central to the Jesus story is that self-giving love 
or what some of us call Kenneke, is the ultimate power in the cosmos and not the sovereignty of the rich and powerful. That actually the sovereignty of the rich and powerful is going against the, 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 the true, what uh, dear Mark Rotherham would refer to as the evolutionary love process that has brought everything into being and continues to. It goes against it. The rich and the powerful and its domination are destroying the world and destroying human lives and destroying our friends and destroying our societies. I'm not saying there is nothing that uh, human beings uh, in, involved in those kinds of systems are carrying that's good. I'm not saying that. I'm not wanting to turn this into nothing but kind of binaries against the good and the bad, as we were thinking earlier. That's not going to bring us a politics of love, but a recognition that the ultimate power in the cosmos, or the suggestion that, or at least being able to process and work with the possibility that real power, real authority, is the power and authority of love and not the power and authority of money, not the power and authority of status, not the power and authority of the established classes. And I suggest this is the time to re-mythologize and re-energize the political system with this kind of love. You don't only find this kind of love in, in Christian myths, of course. We need, and I'll touch on those in a moment, but we need to re-energize the political system with this kind of love. And we need to begin horizontally, because that's where we can do it the most easily. And I'm going to give you, just, just go straight through a seven-point manifesto that's all taken out of the, of the Jesus myth. All taken out of just simply read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and just make a list of the things that that seems to be telling us despite what it may seem to be that organized Christian religion tells us or any other religion tells us or any other disorganized religion might tell us. In stating women, I'm going to resist the temptation because it's time to go at length into these, but I will on this one simply say that after loads of conversation, those of us who came up with this manifesto came up with this word instating uh, because it was what, um, what, what those who were feminists among us felt was, was the best word. Simone de Beauvoir made it quite clear that you can't restore um, women to their right role because they have never been given it. So it's something that could be radically instated and Jesus clearly by beginning uh, as he did, um, and the whole story beginning as it did, and ending as it did, if you know the story, you'll know that women played the key part, whatever people may misinterpret about Paul. Prioritizing children. Just been um, so glad, sorry to pick on you again, Lizzie, but uh, whenever there's a child present in the room, my heart lifts. Because it just seems to me, if we have got no room for children, if children have got to be seen but not heard, even in meetings where people get frustrated and think, I didn't come here to be dis uh, uh, disturbed by a child. Well, then, stuff it. What, 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 what hope for the world is there if we can't make some space for children in our conversations? At least they're bringing us back to reality. Prioritizing children. Sorry if that was offensive to anyone. <laughs> Standing with the poor. Standing with the poor. Not doing things to the poor. We're all poor in some sense, and one of the wonderful things about the Poverty Truth Commission is just to remind us all, it's only a matter of weeks, certainly a matter of months, before however wealthy you might be right now, you could be um, having to find your way around universal credit and losing your house and wondering where you're going to sleep tomorrow. Reintegrating humanity and nature. We had a rather bizarre conversation at our meal table last night where uh, a dear um, Julie Tomlin, who is here with us uh, this afternoon, um, was uh, telling us about um, a, a conversation she'd been having about how much spit Jesus used to make clay out of the mud he put on the person's eyes who, according to the story, he healed. You know, the, 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 the talk about reintegration of humanity and nature. <laughs> Welcoming strangers. I mean, I could just get furious, couldn't you? I mean, what, what, what even vaguely defines a people? If I'm not a particular fan of nation states, but if there is such a thing as nationhood, well, it's created through immigration. How did we get here? Whether you think we started in the Middle East or Africa, we certainly, human race didn't start in Morecambe Bay. <laughs> if we, if we were all immigrants. So for heaven's sake, 
welcoming strangers, restoring the criminalized. It's great to have uh, Sarah here with her expertise in restorative justice, maybe others in the room. What kind of... We need it. Restoring the criminalized, healing the sick. Put that at the end of it, but if... Thank God for the many people in this room who, whose desire to see the well-being of people who are sick has actually given them a desire to see the well-being of the whole society. So, choosing love and solidarity. This is my final A. You may be a person who regards Jesus as an, extra, as an extraordinary human, or like me, recognise him as God incarnate. You may agree with our Muslim brother, Muhammad el Bakri in his little book, A Jihad for Love. If you haven't read A Jihad for Love, it's one of the most heartbreaking little books I've ever come across, where a man mining his Muslim faith finds a, a way to love his enemies, a way to love those who killed his wife. It's just an extraordinary little book. So you may agree what he said when he said, when I meet someone from another faith who allows themselves to be led by love, I have the feeling we share the same religion. Or you might be what agnostic Simon Critchley calls, you might be someone who has what, Simon, uh, what agnostic Simon Critchley calls the faith of the faithless. But whether or not we have a partner or a family to love, we can all connect with transcendent love through friendship. The choice to love creates the solidarity that combines with others to bring about overall well-being. And I, I believe that one of the great things about these conversations is, uh, in some cases, they began with people who were already friends. I mean, people used to say at the first couple of them, well, you know, the reason you're here is you're a friend of Andy. <laughs> but it's very important that there's friendship, not, not friendship that separates out and says you're not in, you're not part, but a friendship that seeks to embrace the other. But if you don't begin with a, con a, 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 a real solidarity of friendship, how can we move beyond that um, to cross over to those who we might regard as people we don't find easy to be our friends. We might find them easier to, first of all, see them as enemies. So, here in Morecambe Bay, let's choose love.